you know, you, you, you've doubled the organism size, but without any real benefit. Yeah, no, thank you for that, that, that question. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so yes, yeah, so there are a few other interesting questions, but I think we should uh, go on to the research talk and hopefully everyone can stay and we can, you know, follow up with all of the remaining questions. Um, that sounds great. Yeah. And I'll definitely be sticking around. So if you're, if you're able to, uh, uh, please do. Okay. So with that, I want to move on to the, the research uh, uh, talk portion. And here I'll go through again, a lot of these same questions and explain some of the work that we've done to try to start to address a lot of these issues. So let's kick things off with how do new group level traits emerge? And so we already discussed snowflake yeast, how they evolve, what they look like in general. And I want to go through this uh, result somewhat quickly so that we could spend more time on the emergence of multicellular heredity. But the basic idea is the following. With snowflake yeast, we are able to figure out that as they grow, they mechanically fracture. Stress builds up inside these clusters until one of these non-reformable bonds breaks, which then gives you two independently viable clusters. Rather than being a problem for snowflake yeast, this was essential to them becoming a multicellular uh, group because it gives them a multicellular reproduction. Interestingly, if you continue the settling speed selection game for eight weeks, you see that the size at fracture nearly doubles. And the reason why they are able to grow to be almost double the size before fracturing is because cells evolve to become longer and as a result, the packing fraction inside these groups, the fraction of space occupied by cells goes down. So in week one, about a third of the cluster is cells, the rest is just fluid. And by week eight, it's only about a fifth of the cluster that cells. Since reproduction is occurring randomly inside the cluster, much like the unicellular ancestor, cells stochastically bump into each other. And if the packing fraction is lower, those collisions happen less often, mechanical stress accumulates more slowly, and you can grow to be larger before fracturing. And that, make, of course, makes you sink better and win at the settling speed selection that occurs every day. Interestingly, we found that the volume fraction emerges very simply from cell shape. We constructed a very, very simple bare bones geometrical model of how snowflake yeast grow. There's no mechanics in this model. It just follows the budding pattern of snowflake yeast with only uh, the cell shapes as an empirical input. But with just that information, these simulations are able to capture the experimentally observed volume fractions nearly perfectly as shown for isolates from one, four, six, and eight weeks of experimental evolution. So again, I know I moved rapidly through this part. This sort of just sets the stage for the next. What I want you to take away from this is that the physics of packing can scaffold the evolution of group level traits. Change the way that cells pack inside snowflake yeast and you change the size that these clusters grow to. The other thing I want to point out is that small changes in cell morphology, small changes in the shape or other properties of individual cells can lead to outsized large changes in the group level morphology, again, through emergence. Okay, now part of the reason why I wanted to go quickly through this first part is a lot of those results might be somewhat specific to snowflake yeast. Right. Another organism that grows a little bit differently might not accumulate internal stress in the same way that snowflake yeast does. But this next topic about the origin of multicellular heredity, we think might be more universal. So just to go over the problem again, for simple or nascent multicellular groups, they lack the developmental genes that are used to uh, develop a group into a complex structure, complex tissue with a complex function. And so instead, cell growth proceeds randomly, much like the unicellular ancestor did. As a result, you might think that this is sort of like folding a uh, paper airplane at random, whereas extant uh, multicellular organisms are more like purposely folding a, uh, a paper airplane so that it can fly. But in physics, we know that stochastic processes can often lead to highly reproducible physical properties. And maybe the most classic example is Brownian motion, where all the wiggling and jiggling of these pollen grains since each one on a unique trajectory, if we look at the position of a pollen grain as a function of time, these trajectories all look different. But if we look at how far the grains move during some time interval, square it, 
average it, we see the emergence of an incredibly robust, highly universal trend. And of course, the uh, with Brownian motion, it's an incredibly well studied, very rich uh, system where we understand a lot of the general rules. What's important for Brownian motion? What's important for these statistics to emerge? And so this leads to the question of, well, for multicellular assembly, are there any general rules or does every multicellular organism grow a little bit differently? And does do those differences really matter? Well, we were able to identify what we think is one universal rule for multicellular assembly. And I would we think that it's inviolable, though. But if someone ever has an example uh, of a violation, I would love to, to hear it because this rule is that cells occupy space. I don't think we're going to find a violation. I don't think we're going to find a cell that does not occupy space. But if you know of one, please let me know. Um, so really, there's three separate rules, all closely related, that are going to be necessary for this next uh, uh, component. Cells occupy space. Groups of cells occupy space. And then finally, the one that is a little more subtle, there's no correlations in the distribution of space within the cluster. OK, so this doesn't mean that you have a completely randomized structure, just that the way that free space is organized inside the cluster, uh, that there's no correlations from cell to cell. OK, so again, this is just with Brownian motion. The fluctuation you experience at one time has no relationship to the fluctuation that you experienced one unit time ago. All right. So if these three facts hold, then it turns out that you're able to completely predict the distribution of volume around each cell in the cluster. This is thanks to a result from soft matter physics, where about 15 years ago, Asti and Di Matteo asked, well, what's the distribution of free space in a granular packing? They constructed a, a, a maximum entropy model, and they were able to show that within those, uh, again, for the same set of rules that I just went through, you have a predictable distribution of free space in your granular packing. Now, the details here don't really matter. I want to point out it's a power law for small volumes. It's an exponential decay for large volumes. And the other thing that I want to point out is this is a so-called two-parameter model. It only depends on the mean volume and the variance of the volume. And then that's really it. OK, so this is sort of like the normal distribution or log normal and any of these other two-parameter distributions. So we looked at those three rules and we said, well, kind of seems like maybe snowflake yeast might follow these rules. Let's go ahead and check. Now, yeast cells scatter light like crazy. They have very, very thick cell walls. And so with optics, you're just never going to be able to see through uh, clusters. We've tried so many different approaches. And once they get uh, significantly large, it's pretty hopeless. So we turned to electron microscopy. Felt a little silly using a technique designed to see nanoscale things to look at uh, things that are hundreds of microns in size, but hey, you do what you have to. With electron microscopy, we could identify the center of every single cell in a group. We then are able to construct a boundary for the group by just calculating a convex hull. There's other ways that you could define the surface of a group. This is actually sort of a non-trivial problem, but it turns out it doesn't really matter. You could just use a bound, the smallest possible bounding sphere. There's lots of different options. None of the results I'm going to tell you about, about depend on how we define the surface. At, at least they don't depend sensibly. With this surface defined, though, we can now construct a Voronoi tessellation um, of uh, the cells inside this cluster. If you're not familiar with Voronoi tessellations, the idea is you take every point inside the cluster and associate it with the cell that's closest to it. OK, and so each one of these different colors represents the small chunk of volume that's closer to one cell than to any other cell in the cluster. This allows us to measure the total volume of the cluster, the number of cells in the cluster, and thus calculate the average Voronoi volume and the variance of the Voronoi volumes. If we look at a histogram of Voronoi volumes in snowflake yeast clusters, then it looks uh, something like this, steep on the small side, slower decline on the uh, large volume side. And that white line is not the best fit line, but is actually the prediction, the maximum entropy model prediction from SD and D Mateo, the K gamma distribution for snowflake yeast. Now, quantifying goodness of fit for nonlinear curves is notoriously difficult. We did 
many, many different things. Tom Day, the uh, excellent student who did, who really did all the uh, the work here, uh, jumped through many, many hoops and came up with lots of great ways to to do this. Let me just share with you one of these approaches because it's kind of the gold standard, which is known as a PP plot, where you plot the observed cumulative distribution function versus the predicted cumulative distribution function. If your predictions are perfect, you get a straight line at a 45 degree angle, slope of one. And so you could see we're not perfect, but you know, it's a, for, for an experiment, it's a really, really good prediction. We've got a little bit of a wiggle, but it's quite close. Now we mentioned we constructed a, a simulation model. With that, we're no longer limited in the statistics that we access. And there we're able to go to, you know, many, many, many uh, iterations of the, uh, the simulations. And here we see a nearly perfect agreement between uh, in the, within the PP plot, where the slope of this line is one down to, I think, the thousandth place. Um, so the agreement is excellent. Again, we looked at many more. Uh, I, we, we, we jumped through lots of hoops to quantify just how good the fit is. Happy to share those details. But the point that I want to make here is because of this, this stochastic process leads to highly repeatable packing statistics. Great, you might be thinking, but why does this have to do with heredity? So let's pause and uh, uh, connect these dots because this is, yeah, this is, it's, it's not a complex idea, but it is somewhat subtle. So the idea is this random growth of cells in snowflake yeast clusters ensures to, that you have these maximum entropy packing statistics, and those packing statistics will then be consistent from parent to offspring, right? Because of that, any multicellular traits, any group level traits that depend on cell packing and cell packing statistics will thus be heritable. They'll be similar from parent to offspring. And that's without any developmental genes. It's again, the stochastic assembly of these groups without correlations that it ensures that this is true. And so one example you may have been able to guess that I would uh, uh, head in this direction is the snowflake yeast fracture size. So if we look at a population of snowflake yeast and measure the size of all the clusters, can compute a histogram, and that's what you're looking at here, you see it's a pretty narrow distribution. This is a log linear plot, right? right? Uh, the, the Y scale is a log. And so you can see that this is actually a nicely exponential distribution of cluster sizes. So we tried to see if we could use packing statistics to explain this distribution of cluster sizes. And this, of course, leads to a question of, well, what determines when these clusters fracture? Because that's going to be the limiting effect that limits the size of snowflake yeast clusters. So the first step that we had to do is figure out what are the odds of fracture actually occurring. And to do so, we relied on, again, more results from recent soft matter physics, but using the soft, a soft matter understanding of packing, you could identify a Voronoi volume that's so small that it's, it's possible, it's achievable, but every cell in the cluster couldn't have a cell, uh, a volume that, that's small. In other words, it couldn't extend across the entire packing. These volumes are going to be essentially cells are packed so densely that if they're pushed just a tiny bit by their neighbors, that will cause fracture. So we identify this critical Voronoi volume. I'm happy to give you more details about how that's done um, if, you're, if you're interested in asking for them uh, afterwards. But for now, you can maybe take me at my word that with a little bit of soft matter physics, this V star can be identified. The K gamma distribution thus allows us to predict the probability that a cell has a volume less than V star, just integrate up to V star. And for snowflake yeast, for the distribution of cell shapes in snowflake yeast, this P star, this probability of having too small of a volume is just a hair under 2%. Now remember the uh, K gamma distribution prediction relied on the idea that there were no correlations in the distribution of volume, right? Just because one cell is densely packed, that doesn't mean its neighbor is densely packed too. And so we then can say, well, for a very simple model, you might expect that the chance that all N cells in a group have a space larger than V star is one minus P star to the nth power. And it turns out when I showed you this histogram, this line going across is not the best exponential fit but is actually the weakest link model prediction 
simply based on the distribution of cell shapes in snowflake yeast, which then leads to V star, which leads to the uh, uh, K gamma distribution and P star and so on. So what, what is this, uh, just to connect the dots again, what this is telling us is the packing statistics are highly consistent from parent to offspring, but group size, it strongly depends on those packing statistics as well. So if you modify how a, a packing occurs in a group, change cell shape, you change the packing statistics and thus change this narrow distribution of cluster size. All right, so that's how heredity, at least for physical traits that relate to packing statistics can emerge. But you might now think, well, wonderful, you understand a lot about snowflake yeast, but what about any organism outside the lab? Does this occur in anything else? And to answer this question, we started collaborating with Ray Goldstein and an excellent postdoc in his lab, Dr. Stephanie Hone, uh, and they do a lot of work on Volvox carteri, that organism I already uh, introduced earlier in the talk. We're now going to focus on the somatic cells on the surface of Volvox, not the germ cells on the inside. We now also have to construct our Voronoi tessellations in two dimensions, really in a curved space in 3D, but uh, and Tom had to do a, go through a lot of headaches to get that to work, but really you could just think of this now as we're constructing Voronoi areas, not Voronoi volumes. But there's another problem, which is Volvox have a polarity. They like to swim towards light, and so it turns out that they're denser packed, the cells on the surface are more densely packed on one side than on the other. And so this violates one of the three assumptions that we said were necessary, right? We said there has to be no correlations. Nevertheless, we went ahead and calculated the distribution of Voronoi areas across the entire cluster, and we see well, it does an okay job. Again, the white line is the k-gamma prediction, not the best fit curve, but it turns out if we instead just look at a small section where the Voronoi areas are relatively consistent, right, so now within this region here, there is no correlation in Voronoi uh, areas from cell to cell, the K-gamma distribution now does an excellent job in predicting the actual empirical distribution of Voronoi areas. So the takeaway here is that the physics of, uh, of cell packing is able to scaffold the emergence of group level heredity, at least when it comes to physical group level traits, which will almost always depend on cell packing. All right, I'm hoping to get through two more results. We'll see how far along we get. Uh, but I'm going to go through these a little bit faster, more to just spur discussion uh, in case anyone's interested. But I want to especially tackle the problem of how do multicellular organisms evolve large size? Because it turns out if you continue this daily settling speed selection for one to two years, you start off with clusters that are very small. After eight weeks, they get a little bit bigger. But after uh, a few hundred uh, days, you suddenly see the emergence of groups that are literally macroscopic in size. And again, I'm not just cherry picking this image. If we look at the entire vial, well, the ancestor just looks turbid because the clusters are so small. Whereas in the evolved, for the evolved populations, you can see lots of clusters that are quite large. These are bigger than fruit flies, okay? This is also highly repeatable. It's been done for five independent lineages. This is a uh, log axis on the Y. So you could see that there's an exponential increase in the size of, uh, of clusters in these five separate um, experimental evolution lineages. Now, the timing of this exponential increase varies, but it always does seem to occur. But I want to point out, first of all, that this is not aggregation that's driving this. This was our first hypothesis. But these cells are not sticky. And one thing that we did was engineer in fluorescent proteins, green into one uh, strain and red into another, grow them together. And when we look inside the tube, what we see, we see either clusters that are totally green or clusters that are totally red. And we never see clusters that combine green and red. So what's going on? Well, the change that we do consistently see is cells get longer and longer, just like we mentioned before. 
And so again, across all five lineages, we see that cells just keep in longer and longer and longer until you have yeast cells with really for yeast cells, just crazy aspect ratios of over three. As individual cell yeast cells, they would not be very happy or healthy. But if we turn back to that simulation model that I mentioned, it turns out our model predicts the packing fraction of these clusters really well, but only to a point, right? Once the cell aspect ratio in the experiments passes two, suddenly the packing fraction goes up rather than down. And it turns out that somewhere between two and 2.5 is also when these macroscopic sizes emerge, right? So you have microscopic clusters if cells are, are not as highly elongated, but when they are highly elongated, suddenly you have macroscopic sizes. So what's going on? Well, again, we turn to electron microscopy. Looking inside these dense clusters, what we saw was that you have essentially a jumbled and tangled series of chains of cells. And it turns out tangling is exactly the right word. We found that we essentially now have individual chains of cells. You could think of them as cellular polymers that have these other daughter connections, just like the ancestral snowflake yeast clusters but you have separate cellular polymers that are not directly connected. So now breaking one of these non-reformable bonds doesn't fracture the cluster into two pieces. Instead, they're able to remain together because these separate chains of cells are entangled. And in fact, if you look across a cluster, these entanglements percolate to the point where if you wanted to move one of these cellular chains, you would have to move all of the cellular chains in the entire cluster. And so this is what actually holds these groups together. It's much like a physical gel from polymer science or like an entangled uh, clump of staples uh, from granular materials, or instead of, instead of staples, we have entangled yeast chains. Now, because of this, we were able to compare to, uh, uh, again, results from soft matter physics where folks studied entangled chains and they found that when chains entangle, you have a nonlinear stress strain curve, that's these up here, whereas when they aren't entangled, you have a nice Hookian system. And by doing mechanical testing on snowflake yeast, we were able to observe the same phenomenon. The ancestor, which is not entangled, it has a, a, an almost perfectly linear relationship between stress and strain, whereas the macroscopic clusters have a nicely nonlinear relationship again, consistent with the idea that entanglement is driving the evolution of large size. It turns out if you look around at many different multicellular organisms, you start to see entanglement just about everywhere. Anywhere where you have chains of cells, anywhere where you have these biopolymers, you end up uh, quite often with entanglement. And so we think that this might actually be a much more general process for achieving a material that is both strong and tough and easy to assemble. All right, very briefly, I want to just mention to sort of complete uh, the comparison to the tutorial talk, I want to say something about morphological complexity and intercellular interactions and how these contingent effects might impact evolution downstream. I'm going to return to this idea that in the our understanding of the evolution of division of labor, there's a lack of experimental data showing this, these accelerating returns that seem to be necessary. One thing these previous models didn't account for is topology, something that in physics we often think a lot about. And it turns out that simple multicellular organisms also often have sparse topologies, linear filaments, branch chains, and so on. And so without going into all the details, we built a, a model of a, a multicellular fitness that allows for division of labor and can change the returns from being concave to convex, but accounts for the topology of an organism. And it turns out if you look at a well-mixed topology, every cell, every cell can interact with every other cell, then you capture this classic result. This heat map is showing when you specialize, which is blue means uh, specialized, yellow means generalists. The y-axis is how much do you uh, share with uh, other cells, and the x-axis is the power law exponent. So to the right of the blue line, you have uh, concave curves, and to the left, you have convex. And so what we see is if everyone interacts with everyone, then you have to have accelerating returns for division of labor to be adapted for it to maximize fitness. But what if you have a simple nearest neighbor ring? 
In that case, it turns out you can evolve specialization even with convex returns. What if you have a bipartite graph? Every other cell connects, even cells connect with odd cells, odd cells connect with even cells. In that case, you can actually, a uh, uh, division of labor is adaptive all the way down to even some very small power law exponents. So even when you have uh, highly diminishing returns with the right topology, you can end up with um, division of labor, labor being adaptive. Now, these might seem like special cases, but it turns out that it's even true if you pick uh, connections at random. So again, here's this same plot showing specialization for this ring topology. But what if we just generate a bunch of random uh, 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 networks, keeping, say, the number of total number of connections constant? Well, it turns out you find almost exactly the same curve. So even for these randomly assembled uh, uh, clusters, these randomly assembled networks, as long as you have this sparse interaction topology, you can always end up with this convex specialization. So we think that these, these sparse uh, networks actually uh, um, uh, favor the division of labor. Um, uh, and it turns out that for simple multicellular organisms, they often have these sort of sparse interaction topologies. And so this might resolve this open question. Why don't we see accelerating returns on investment in these simple systems? Well, maybe, not definitively, but maybe those accelerating returns weren't actually necessary. All right. With that, I want to return to this idea that physics in all these cases scaffolds the emergence of all of these complicated phenomena automatically through topology, mechanical interactions, uh, and so on. With that, I want to thank the, the folks who actually did the work, especially Tom Day. Um, I want to thank all of my excellent collaborators, Will Ratcliffe, Ray Goldstein, Stephanie, and on. And I'd like to thank again the organizers for having me and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank the speaker for a really fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, this is the number of questions this raises. I don't know about everyone else, but I now have like a dozen new papers I want to read over the <laughs> over the weekend. Um, so uh, let's do, I think, a couple of questions maybe from the chat. I see there are also hands raised. Um, so let's do a couple of questions about the research talk um, bef you know, while we're still recording. And then I guess let's stop recording and move to the more you know, informal um, part of the session and then wrap up a lot of questions. You know, that they're more from the research talk, also some back from the tutorial talk. So I guess let us go to, I think the first question from the research talk, uh, which is from Kat uh, Trianda Filou. Um, and feel free to unmute if you would like to ask the question yourself, or I can read it for you, um, whatever you prefer. Um, uh, yeah, I can I can ask the question. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Great. Uh, okay, so my question was about, um, it seems like the uh, multicellularity evolved super quickly, like way faster than any time scale I would have guessed. So I guess I was just wondering, you know, what are the implications about that in terms of like the accessibility of that as an adaptation and it, the sort of degree to which you see it in nature, let's say? Yeah, great, great question. And so with the snowflake yeast experiments, one of the, th there's maybe two relevant uh, uh, things uh, that, that I want to bring up. First, we have a very strong selection pressure for large size. And so if organisms in nature live in an environment with a very strong selection for large size, we might see something similar. If it's a weaker selection pressure for large size, then the process might be a little bit uh, slower. So some of the speed we see might be because of that, the strength of that selection. You've got to make it to the bottom of the tube. The other thing is it's possible that yeast cells just sort of were already ready for this transition to occur. There was there were pre-adaptations that existed that were necessary for this to happen, right? You already have these, the possibility for these permanent, these unreformable intercellular bonds, which made a lot of the downstream evolution so simple. Whereas if you 
Will's lab has also done experimental evolution on flock yeast, which are sticky yeast cells. And there, if you do the same process still for hundreds of days, you don't see the evolution of new group level traits. You really just see the evolution of cells that grow faster. So I think it's, mo I think it's largely those two aspects, but that might suggest if we look into nature that when you have a system that uh, hits you know, the, the right uh, uh, aspects, when it has the right properties, maybe this transition is relatively fast, but if you're not quite in the right spot, we, yeah, it's possible that it's not as rapid as the experiments make it seem. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, it almost makes me think like maybe there would be an advantage to sort of being poised on the edge of multicellularity. Like maybe you would find that more frequently than you would expect. Yeah, that's really interesting. I would I would love to think and chat more about that because with so many simple multicellular groups, you might speculate if that could be an advantage where they, rather than continuing down the road and becoming more and more specialized such that they become worse and worse single cells if they ever reverted, if you stay relatively simple, you might be able to go back and forth. And actually, there's some fungal lineages that have gone back and forth from multicellular to unicellular to multicellular over the years. So yeah, great point. Very cool. Thanks so much. Thank you. Th th thanks for a really, really fascinating question. Um, so I guess let's do, I suppose, let's do one more question kind of on the record and then stop recording and then go to the more informal. Um, and so I think, uh, so there was a question from Anna Hancock, but I think she might've had to leave if that's yes. Um, but I guess, let me ask, let me read the question anyway. Um, so regarding the change in the size at fracture after eight weeks, uh, in addition to changing volume fraction, could they evolve differences in the stiffness of the cell-cell contacts, or is that uh, completely fixed or prescribed by the properties of the chitin ring? Uh, and then um, follow up, you know, stiffness and or fracture properties. Great, great question. And so this is absolutely something that, that we looked into because honestly, one of the first things we thought is, hey, maybe they've gotten tougher. Right. Volume fraction, honestly, you know, full disclosure, that wasn't our first guess. We thought maybe they're getting tougher and that might explain how they get bigger. But it turns out the chitin rings are very similar. The density of chitin doesn't change across those eight weeks. And actually, even further through uh, more and more days of uh, settling speed selection. Now, we also we did a little bit of modeling work where we looked at uh, for our simple model, if you increase the uh, the the uh, stress at which fracture occurs, you of course will end up with larger and larger clusters, but it's a slowly increasing fraction of that uh, that ultimate size. The way to think about it is as cells bump into each other more and more, the stress starts increasing non-linearly. And so if you just say, well, let's double how strong these bonds are, you're going to reach that new threshold relatively quickly because you now have an incredibly dense interior where cells are just bumping like crazy, okay? So it turns out that it's a much more efficient path. It's not that you couldn't evolve stronger bonds and get larger size, you absolutely could, but it's much, much more efficient, much simpler to evolve a decreased packing fraction. There's more bang for your buck, I guess is another way to think of it. Okay. Yeah, thank you, another great question. Thanks. Um, so, uh, I apologize for the noise outside my window there. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're, we're turning this into a party if you can hear the, the music out there. Uh, so, um, I think let's officially thank the speaker again and, uh, we'll stop recording and then we'll continue as long as everyone wants to hang out. Um, if we can, we can work our way through all the questions in the chat, um, and any That'd other questions or discussion people have. Um, and also I'll, I'll send, um, I'll send you the, the chat questions, Peter, in case you want to follow up with anyone. So that sounds, that sounds great. Yeah. Thank no, you. So officially, um, and with the music from the bank parking lot behind me, thank you for a fantastic set of talks. Uh, and thanks to the audience for joining us. And I'm now going to officially, hold on, stop recording.